left the family and taken up with another woman. And McMurdy walked into this impoverished woman's home and persuaded to give, give her children away. She took them back with her to Port-au-Prince, where, with the support of her Pittsburgh church, she started an orphanage that housed them and similarly situated children. The children were sent, these particular children were sent into an adoption in South Dakota. Brutal material circumstances met 21st century evangelical Christian gender politics, and the children of Haitian single mothers became orphans available for adoption to the United States. U.S.-based evangelical churches were involved in similar operations around the world, an extension of the Christian rights' intense affection for fetuses and their profound mistrust of the women who carried them. They did not trust, do not trust, impoverished mothers to raise their children properly either, not unless there's a father involved. This ever more explicit alliance between the U.S. federal government and fundamentalist churches flowered during George W. Bush's presidency but it took its blueprint from <clears throat> the Ronald Reagan years. Reagan and his right-wing allies in Central America were actively promoting the U.S.-based Christian rights involvement in the region at the same time that they were calling liberation theology priests and catechists terrorists and allowing tacitly their murder by death squads. Although the story has inevitably grown more complex in the intervening years, the rapid growth of the Christian right in Guatemala occurred during this period, when membership in an evangelical church rather than a Catholic one <coughs> marked out the difference between anti-communists and communists, between those marked for death and those allowed to live by the military in Civil War Guatemala. The ideology of overpopulation that marked development projects during the Cold War has now receded, as Goldberg notes. When I wrote about the rise of eugenics, overpopulation, sterilization, and birth control as discourses of modernization and development in my first book, Reproducing Empire, I was describing a secular, liberal centrist project that in fact understood itself to be at odds with conservative Catholicism. Throughout much of the period I was discussing there, from the 1890s through the 1970s, fundamentalist Protestants did not particularly regard gender and reproduction as its critical issues, or feminism as its mortal enemy, the way Catholics did. They were worried about science and evolution. More broadly, by the 1920s, conservatives in general were reluctant to support US involvement overseas, with the important exception of World War II. So until 1980, US reproductive politics overseas were largely a liberal project. Reproductive governance in the development era was about creating small families through birth control and sterilization, and often proceeded under the name of women's empowerment and education, however much it may also actually have been about control and coercion. But to go back to Goldberg, her narrative about the shift in US reproductive governance projects from the liberal overpopulation establishment to Christian right culture wars and secular white nativism omits two significant things that can helpfully be su supplemented by feminist scholars. One is adoption and its relationship to the ongoing effects of the scars of the Cold War in places like Guatemala. The second thing Goldberg leaves out is the economy and the effect of neoliberalization, which has more or less wiped out social welfare systems for impoverished people, especially children schools, hospitals, public orphanages, and feeding programs in Guatemala. Large-scale industrialization projects backed by international development loans are increasingly unpopular in Latin America after the debt crises of the 70s and 80s, which made the destruction of social welfare systems possible um, through structural adjustment policies, largely replaced by entrepreneurial, women-centered, family-based capitalism imagined by the microcredit loan establishments. The essential social welfare functions of the state have been abandoned to be filled by NGOs and, you guessed it, churches and other religious groups. Adoption is basically a small-scale replication of this kind of privatization, where instead of economic development or public services to support families and communities, you have religious and secular NGOs plucking individual children out of families to be saved by being relocated to wealthier families in places like the United States. 
that these kinds of measures could never be more than a minuscule fraction of impoverished children in the world seems not to matter to this debate. In Guatemala, adoption to the United States became the alternative to building a child welfare system, a state-sponsored child welfare system, which seems bitterly fitting given the role of U.S. military aid in helping to destroy those with an alternative mission of the Guatemalan state. Here I want to argue that transnational adoption is best understood as another site in globalized culture wars about gender, sexuality, and reproduction. So in this next section, I want to lay out a small history of the debate over adoption in Guatemala in the 1990s. And my narrative it provides a rather sharp counter-narrative to what the US press and US-based pro-adoption groups have been telling. In the narrative we've been reading and hearing here in the US, adoption fraud has occasionally been discovered in Guatemala. And at every turn, the US State Department has responded to ensure that women and children are protected. In 2008, new evidence came to light, we, we hear. And as a result of this discovery, uh, in the reassuring narrative of our national security state, adoption from Guatemala had to be halted. What I want to show you is that this is far from true. And there's been overwhelming evidence for a very long time that something was amiss in Guatemalan adoption. What the US-based narrative obscures is the work of a transnational Christian right that has strongly supported transnational adoption as an alternative to either a social welfare state or single mother households. I think this is an important story in itself, but it also <coughs> sheds light on how larger processes of neoliberalization, religion, and ideology are shaping a transnational economy of reproduction and sexuality. On July 24, 2008, the Associated Press in the U.S. reported on the case of Ana Escobar, whose daughter, Esther Sulamita, was reportedly kidnapped by Guatemalan traffickers and then nearly adopted by a couple from the United States. After searching orphanages and hospitals for her for six months, Escobar found a girl she said was her daughter. Esther was about to be taken out of the country by her would-be adopted parents. DNA tests subsequently established that Escobar was right and that the girl was her daughter. The Associated Press quoted a Guatemalan official, Jaime Tecu, as indicating that the test results represented the first time officials had directly linked a baby reported stolen from its mother to the country's fraud-plagued adoption system. Now, this is a paraphrase of what Jaime Te Tecu said, not a direct quote, and it's an odd <coughs> sentence by the AP writer. Was Guatemala's adoption system known to be fraud plagued even before officials linked a child about to be adopted to a birth parent whose child had been kidnapped? There were many in the U.S. and Guatemala who took the position that there was no fraud in, in Guatemalan adoptions, especially before the Ana Escobar case, and some have continued to insist on it even afterward. So the story, the AP story, goes on to clarify that unnamed authorities have long said that children were stolen or bought before thousands of pending adoptions were frozen in net. Authorities then are proven right. A logical and now largely transparent system is in place in which authoritative knowledge could be relied upon first to shut down adoptions and then by giving proper opportunity, given the proper opportunity to halt the whole system and conduct unhurried investigations to find evidence for what they had suspected. The next sentence takes us once again into the world of unproven claims. Quote, the, child, the child's mother, Ana Escobar, said armed men locked her in a closet in March 2007 at the family's shoe store north of Guatemala City and took the six-month-old. Mothers say they make claims that can't be verified. Officials produce test results that directly link. Now, reading this story across multiple national presses is revealing. The BBC, for example, repeated the claim that it was the first time such a story had been confirmed, which filled in additional details. Escobar had gained access to international media as a feminist activist, demonstrating with other men, mothers in front of the new CNA building, the CNA being the central authority authorizing adoptions that was brought into existence by Guatemala's efforts to accede to the Hague Convention on Intercountry Adoption. 